Welcome to Grounded. Today we're going to study in the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi chapters 3 through 5. We're going to look at God's plan for us and the important role that each of us play today. We're also going to look at some of the difficult topics that we have and especially cultural issues that some of us may struggle with. And finally, we're going to talk about living after the manner of happiness. Welcome to Grounded, where women of all ages, nationalities, and backgrounds gather with me, Barbara Morgan Gardner, and my guests as we seek to build a bedrock understanding of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and become like Him. I am here today with my wonderful friend, Tracy Browning. Tracy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Barbara. President Nelson has reminded us all recently that we are children of God, children of the covenant, and that we are disciples of Christ. In addition to those identities, how would you describe yourself? Well, I often, you know, first let me just say that I, I love those particular identities because they inform so much about who I am and my purpose and what drives me and what my where my desires lie. But we know that there are other identities that we have that yeah make us complete people. And it would be remiss for me to say that at the top of the list is also that I'm a wife and a mother, because those are things that are also really important to me and are informed my, by my discipleship and my identity and relationship with God. And also the fact that I'm a covenant maker because I have this family who I'm just, I, I think so much of. So I've been married for 26 years and I have a young adult daughter and a 17 year old son. Wow. And I also... How, how do you possibly have children that old? I, it's, it, <laughs> yeah, I wake up every once in a while wondering the same question, too, because I still remember being 16. Yeah, exactly. So, but here we are. I know, here we are. And they're a blessing. Yeah. And I love it. I also serve as second counselor in the primary general presidency for the church. Uh, this is an important assignment in my life as well, because it also is um, an opportunity for me to learn more about what it is that God wants me to know about who he needs me to be in his kingdom and as his daughter and how I can I can serve him in that way as well. Perfect. And, and you know what, Tracy, I so appreciate with an eight year old and a 10 year old, both daughters, uh, the example that you are for them as they're able to watch you on friend to friend and just kind of see your life and, and who who they can become. So we thank you primary. for being that. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Thank awesome. you. Should we dive into the scriptures here today, Tracy, and, and look what we can learn, principles and doctrines and teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yeah, let's do that. Do you want to do you want to guide us a little bit? What, what stands out to you first in these chapters? This was just a really a joy to study these particular chapters in Second Nephi three through five. I, I felt a lot of my mind expanding as I was considering new ways of examining these the verses that I was reading in here. I think, for instance, chapter three, initial, initially as I read them, as we know, there's a lot of conversation about the raising of a prophet, Joseph Smith, as a seer, yeah. and having that being foretold in these scriptures. But as I dove a little deeper into reading this chapter, I really started to understand just how long and how far in advance the Lord's mercy extends to his children yeah. and how much he sends prophets to see our day and to see us as people and to understand what we need and to make sure that we are blessed in, in all of that vision, that there are things that he's looking to provide for us and he provides that so far in advance. We're talking about Joseph of Egypt, seeing the Nephite people, yeah. seeing generations of them, understanding that there may be a time where mistakes have been made by their ancestors, and we don't want those mistakes to be counted on the heads of their children. So he makes allowances for that. He raises a seer that has <laughs> words that are gonna be given to those people to help bring them salvation, bring them to the knowledge of their savior in case they forgot. This is all found there, and it kind of reminded me how far in advance is God trying to bless me today, but also bless my posterity? How far in advance does he see us? You know, I, I, can't, I can't explain how important that point is. I was thinking as I was reading through this how we're talking about the covenant path, and we're talking about Abraham and Sarah and, and we're talking, I mean, the Lord even talks about those and in, those individuals in this very uh, section that we're reading here and, and how important it is to know that this is a family. The Book of Mormon yeah. is a story of family. Yes. And, you know, as mothers, we and, and, and parents and siblings, we care so deeply about these people. And really, 
this gathering and scattering and the gathering of Israel again is, is this, our, our heavenly parents bringing this eternal family together and us having the opportunity to have the fullness of joy in the eternities with them. Absolutely. We often look at these individuals in our own families, but this is, we are the big family of God, yeah. right? This, we are his children and he cares about us and he is going to bring us back. Absolutely. And I love that you've highlighted that the Book of Mormon is a story about families. I think because it ends where we get a sense of nations have risen. Yeah. But it's important to remember that this story starts with mom, dad, brother, sister, neighbor, good friend, all coming over to this new world because the Lord is trying to help them raise up nations that will eventually allow us to um, to see how he works with his children. Yeah. You have nations that were in the old world, and then you have nations that are in the new world. But he does this in really small and simple means and through through ways that we can understand, huh? like family, yeah. like mom and dad and brothers and sisters. And then we're watching that relationship unfold in these pages in between, what happens to them. And I think that there's some real things about family that shows up in yeah. these particular chapters that are incredibly relatable. You know, there's there's tension, there's struggle, there's conflict, there's division. I think that there's some of that that we can identify at times with our own families that help us understand what is God trying to teach us that testifies of Jesus Christ through those kind of circumstances? Where What are we supposed to learn? And, and I see so much story about Family, absolutely, simple family stories, and then God's mercy laid on top of that. There's, there's a lot of content in there that talks about that. Absolutely, and as you're saying that, and you're talking about family, I also think of how much President Nelson has talked about covenant relationships, and he has this great talk where he talks about, in the Everlasting Covenant, he talks yeah. about our relationship with God, and then he talks about our relationship with each other, and how we need to be focusing on those two areas. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I love in chapter three, where, where Lehi is giving these blessings to his children. I mean, this isn't just some blessing. This is a blessing yeah. to Joseph. And then we see in the next chapter, yeah. he's now giving a blessing. And, and I love that he calls him, he says, thou art little, right? I just wonder how yeah. little he was. Yeah. And then in chapter four, I love that he starts talking to Laman and Lemuel. And I love that he includes you know, Laman, his sons and his daughters. So many times throughout these chapters, he says, he says unto them, behold, my sons and my daughters, who are the sons and the daughters. And verse five, it's daughters again. Verse eight, daughters, daughters. Verse nine, he has daughters three times. They're, yeah. It's so important. Sometimes in the scriptures, we're looking for women. And in here, yeah. these blessings are for the sons and daughters of Lehi. And frankly, Absolutely. the sons and daughters of, of Abraham and Sarah, the sons and daughters of God. And I just think yeah. it's so beautiful and that he has really a purpose for, for all of us. These, these prophecies that he had for Joseph, Joseph of old, as you mentioned, mentioned this little Joseph here, yeah. Joseph Smith and his father, going forward and these prophecies that, that the plan has been set for them and the plan is also set, if I may go there, to us. Absolutely. Absolutely it's set for us. And I think, again, this idea of we can, we can see ourselves in here because that's what we would expect to happen in a family. This is a father who's giving his final blessings to his children, yep. who are gathering his grandchildren together, and he's looking at all of them. He's seeing his sons and his daughters, and he's recognizing that what he desires for them are, are, are similar. We want you to grow in the knowledge of God. We want you to be blessed, and we want you to be prospered. And that's no different for his sons than his daughters. So he's going to call it out. I'm sure that's happening in your home. You've got two daughters that you mentioned. Absolutely. Right? Yep. These blessings, you want them for your daughters. I have a son and a daughter. We, we're doing these things in our homes because this is our stewardship as parents. And we see that pattern. Here, we see that pattern with Heavenly Father. This is what he's doing. He's making, he's sending blessings and looking for ways to, to, to uh, give to us all that he has to both his sons and his daughters. And he's calling that out, that what I'm offering to you is equally offered to both my sons and my daughters. And you know, Tracy, that's such a great point. I think of my, my parents, they had 13 children, right? And we had I think we, we have eight sisters and five brothers. Sometimes I didn't know if I have nine or yeah. six. I mean, I, we there's, always had random like people. There's, yeah, there's lots of people. Of the family. Yeah. yeah. But I was thinking when you were talking about that of my own father, and as he was passing away, he tried so hard to have every one of his children and grandchildren. And the thing that he would say every single time to all of us was just, I love you. I love you. He would say every person that came into the house and before they would leave, he would just leave them with that. And I think that that's, we're seeing Lehi 
as he's just saying, I want my family to be eternal. Like, I see yeah. that with my dad. Like He would say, please, don't be offended by each other. Yeah. Please, forgive quickly. Yeah. Please. And he would, just, he would just plead with us at the end of his life that we as a, as a family would just forgive quickly, love each other dearly, and recognize nothing else really matters, guys. It's all about us coming unto Christ. And his, his last dying desire was that feeling of just please, you know, yeah. please come together, please be one. And, but then also remember the atonement of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. There, there's something in there for me also that as I was reading these passages, the importance of being remembered um, in, in that gathering um, that as he's leaving, he's leaving something to, to his posterity and he's taking a lot of time to remember yeah. his sons and his daughters in that gathering. You know, I, I have a father who suffers from uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, and he's losing his memory. This is really oh, hard. Yeah. This is hard for families, this, um, this, this loss of memory because it feels like you might be lost to a person. Yeah. Um, and there are these moments with my father where he will remember me. Mm. And I know, that, I, I know that we're coming to the end of his life. Yeah. And the moments that are sweetest to me right now are to be remembered as his daughter. So whenever I hear my name, even if he's not directing it at me, just to hear my name come out of his mouth, I know how important it is to be remembered. And there's something beautiful and significant, especially for daughters, yeah. daughters in God's kingdom. We want to feel seen and remembered by our Father. And I think there's a pattern here in these particular verses that reminds us that in that gathering, God gathers us as his children, both his sons and his daughters, and he wants us to see ourselves here as part of that gathering, as part of being offered that blessing, as part of being told, these are the things that I desire for you and that I'm offering it to you equally, that you can have this too. You're here at the gathering. You've been invited. And will you accept it? Will you accept this? Will it help to fan your desires so that your future can in encompass all, what, all of what is being offered to you? You know, you know Tracy, on, on that personal note, I, I think about your father with dementia. My, my, my mother passed away from brain cancer. So you can imagine at the end of, of her life, there was a lot of forgetting and a lot of confusion. Yeah. And one of the most tender moments for me, I say this to you as one who likely will be losing your father soon, was after my mom passed away and teaching the gospel to my students in class and feeling the presence of my mom. My mom was ill for so many years that I never, she was never with me in a classroom. I never, I never got to teach with her, you know? And it was the first time after she had passed away that I knew she was with me and I knew that she had, she had the experience of just being with me in a very holy and safe space. Yeah. So sometimes that, that passing beyond the veil as we're seeing with, with Lehi here brings so much joy that we can't have in this earth because mortality is mortality. We've, we've fallen in a sense, but the comma that happens allows for the joy and, and the relationships even on the other side of the veil, as President Nelson has spoken of so often. I, I so agree with you. And I think that as we think about these chapters, especially chapter three, um, and even into chapter four, we see the veil diminishing. Yeah. Because we're seeing, we're being told that there are those who see so, so far into the future. Yeah. And have an understanding of things that we don't have an understanding of in the presence. Why, why is it so important that at times the Lord continues to say, I'm going to dissolve this veil yeah. so that you can see a grand vision of how far in advance I'm thinking of you and I'm thinking of your posterity to, to understand that there is a future that is always in front of the Lord that he's trying to provide for us. And, and I see that. I see the veil diminishing oh. in, in, in chapter three and the Lord sending out a vision Absolutely. that goes beyond the limitations of our present day understanding. In fact, Tracy, one of the words that I have marked in here is prophecy. So yeah. in, in chapter three, verse, verse 16, I have, yea, thus prophesied Joseph. And he's talking about Moses, but he's also, I mean, he's going to be gone, but he sees these things. Absolutely. In chapter, in verse 22 of chapter three, he says, and now behold, my son, Joseph, after this manner, did my father of old prophesy. So he's saying he did, he saw, he has now passed away. My father of old prophesied about you. And then in chapter four, now I, Nephi, speak concerning the prophecies of my father. And then we see it again in, in chapter four, verse three. 
He says, Wherefore, after my father had made an end of speaking concerning the prophecies of Joseph, he called the children of Laman and his sons and his daughters, and unto them, uh, Behold, my sons and daughters, who are the sons and the daughters of my firstborn, I would that ye should give ear unto my words. And then he tells them what's going to happen again in their future. Yes. I, I, I love... There's a, an important talk that we have heard over and over again as sisters, especially. I think we talk about it often. It's the plea to my sisters. Yes, remember that talk? Absolutely. What did Seminole. you think when you heard that? What, do you remember the moment? Because I remember the moment. I'm wondering, I do, do you? I remember an, an, an accountability feeling like I'm being directly spoken to and I'm being spoken about. Yeah. And there was an invitation that I felt quite accountable yes. to. It was, it was really a... Um, a really sort of ennobling sort of message to me. I felt I felt like there was something here that was important that I was important. Yeah, I agree. And that I that there was really a there was a place for me and things that I needed to do. Tra- Tracy, I I mean I would ima- I wish we could have just been sitting there in the room together and just staring at each other what? because I when I heard that I just thought what 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 is going on? Like, yeah. What am I feeling? What, yeah. what? But this is one of the things that I love is that he uses the prophecy of President Kimball. Yes. And President Kimball, yes. so, so President Nelson says this. He says, 36 years ago in 1979, President Kimball made a profound prophecy about the impact that covenant-keeping women would have on the future of the Lord's church. And then here's the prophecy. Much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world will be drawn to the church in large large numbers. This will happen to the degree that the women of the church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives and to the degree that women of the church are seen as distinct and different. And then he says, in happy ways from the women of the world. And and I, I don't know about you, Tracy, when he said that, I just thought, wait, Okay, who's you know who's he talking about? Is that really real? But then he answers it. Do you want to read this, Tracy? Can absolutely. I can I give this to you to read? Yeah, yeah, it's right absolutely. here. It says, President Nelson then declared, "My dear sisters, you are you who are our vital associates during this winding up scene. The day that President Kimball foresaw is today. You are the women he foresaw." I mean, it's just isn't that incredible? Back it's to stunning. Second Nephi. It's stunning. It's stunning. Yeah. Because it reminds us again that the Lord sees us, we're part of the gathering, we're invited, he knows us, he remembers us, he wants us to understand that we're remembered, and there is place for us yeah. in his kingdom. It, it, to me, to me it, it, is, it is so powerful right now what the Lord is asking the women of the church to do through yeah. his prophets and apostles. Absolutely. And he's preparing the way for us to do it. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons where, why we're even meeting here today is we recognize we need to know the scriptures. We need to be grounded. We need to speak up and speak out as he's asked us to do. And the best way to do that is to be grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. He invites us to righteousness. Yeah. Learn righteousness. Learn <laughs> how to be godly. He yep. invites us to be articulate. Remember that bearing your testimony is an important part of that gathering aspect. The ways that you describe the feelings of your relationship with Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father, the things that come to you through the Spirit that you are willing to share with others will invite others to ask important questions that lead them towards their Savior, that leads the Spirit to fan their desires to do things that you've done, like be covenant-bound to the Savior. These are important things. And to be different and distinct in happy ways. Yeah. And we read things about happiness in yes, these chapters, we did. didn't we? We did. We Should did. we go there? Should we go to this topic of so. this manner of happiness? I think so. So, Tracy, if I am thinking the same thing you are, I'm thinking of chapter 5, verse 27. Yeah. Which to me is fascinating because, well, I'll read it first and I'll tell you why it's fascinating. He says, and it came to pass that we lived after the manner of happiness. Yeah. So, okay, here's my deal. And then you fill this in. Nephi has, again, we're talking about a family. He's now lost his parents. He's lost his father, who was the prophet. Nephi is second only, it seems, to the one who was trying to help his family become righteous and try to follow this covenant path. His brothers do not like it. It looks like maybe his wife, some of the, some of the wives of the brothers don't like it. Ishmael's children are upset. I mean, there's just there's just this contention that you just feel, and it's so real. I, mean, I think in our world today, we 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 feel this contention even in our family sometimes. Yes. And, and, and maybe especially in our families sometimes. So, so he has this contention. It gets so bad that Nephi, and it's, to me it's one of the saddest parts of the Book of Mormon, is when Nephi says that the Lord commanded me that I should depart from them. Yeah. Oh, I, 
I mean, family is everything to me. And to get a commandment from the Lord. I mean, Nephi already had to kill Laban, but now he's being told to leave his family, his brothers. His, I mean, I don't know everybody he left, but we do know he took with him Sam and Zoram and those who were obedient. Yes. But I just think... And then he talks about, you know, all of these struggles and we get this psalm of Nephi and, oh, wretched man that I am. And you see all this sadness, but then you have, we lived after the manner of happiness. <laughs> what is that, Tracy? What Guide us through this too, will you? I think that's such an important question. And I think it's really important, especially in a day and age where we are beset with challenges. Um, I'm thinking of President Nelson's message about uh, spiritual momentum when he says that the adversary is really just heightening his, um, his attacks on us, that that's real. Yeah. And, and I think that we're feeling the effects of that. And sometimes families are feeling the effects of that. And so much is happening in the world. And where do we look for our sanctuary? Where do we go to find relief? Where do we go to, to find a source of peace? And how do we really, um, how do we really absorb what we know is truth about who we are and what we were designed for? We're told that men are that they might have joy. Yes. How do we do that in a world that sometimes can seem, look, feel less than joyful at times? How do we do that when there's conflict in our families that are not as joyful as we would desire them to be? Where we're asked to separate, where there are consequences for disobedience, where there's tension. It is a reminder that our sanctuary and the places that we place our joy in is, is in Jesus Christ. Where are we grounded? We're grounded in the Savior. We're grounded in our relationship. We seek to look for joy in Him. Right. And and that goes beyond our circumstances. We've heard this from President Nelson. Yeah, absolutely. Right? What is the focus of our lives? Yep. The focus of our lives is our relationship with Jesus Christ and is not the joy that we have is not found in the variance of our circumstances. It's focused in, it's it's found in our focus on Jesus Christ. And I think this is what they're saying. Look at what they did after they were separated. After Nephi had to take those who were obedient and willing to follow yeah. all the teachings of Lehi and, and the reasons why they came to this land, this new world. The, they took those people and they immediately started to build a temple. Like the first thing they did. Like the right? first thing they did. Yeah. Right? It kind of tells you where their focus is. Yes. It tells you what their priorities are. So when they start to speak about being after a manner of happiness, they're not talking about their circumstances. They're talking about rejoicing in the things that they know to be true and what they had been taught and the fact that with them came the scriptures. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So they didn't just take the people, they took the records and they took the things that were important to them that pointed them back to Jesus Christ. And then that was where they put all of their time and their energy in. They became industrious. They focused on things of the spirit. They focused on obedience. And and the manner of happiness that they found in that was to live their lives looking for joy in the Savior, even though things are hard, even though things are challenging, because life is real. And I'm always so grateful when I just kind of buck up against reality and things that feel really relatable. And I love that you called out Nephi's kind of pleading prayer that felt so human because we know Nephi. Nephi is strong and he is a leader and he is a disciple and it's so clear. And then you have this intimate private moment where he's pleading to God saying, I'm beset by sin and challenges and, and temptations. And this is so hard. And and my family is my enemy. What's happening? <laughs> and you my know? parents, who are my biggest support, have passed away. They're gone? They're not even, yeah. Like what's He's an happening? orphan as far as yes. his parents. Yeah. What's happening? And then he turns, he transitions in chapter four, verse 20. My God hath been my strength. He has been uh, led me through mine afflictions in the wilderness and hath preserved me upon the waters of the great deep. He has this deep and abiding testimony. And there you feel the wellings of joy. Yeah. You feel the happiness. You feel, okay, okay, all of this is happening. But look at what God's still doing for me. Look at what he's doing. Look at what we have. We have a temple. We have a land. We have people who are believers. We have the records. And he turns his tension and, and his purpose towards that. And I think that's that's a really important... I agree. It's so important to understand that. You know, I, I, when you brought that those verses up, Tracy, it just, 
these verses are so incredible, incredible because they're actually, he's bearing his testimony. Yes, he is. What he's saying there is, I mean, you listen to what he's, he's talking about all these difficulties, but then he says, he has supported me. And you can think already what we know of Nephi, when has God supported him? We've seen this. And then he yes. says, he's brought me across the great deep. He did. He did. He and called then, me to remember yeah, that. Remember? Exactly. Remember? He filled me with his love. He, we had that happen in the vision, right? Absolutely. Was, every one of these, as you go through these verses, he's conf confounded mine enemies. He stopped Laman and Lemuel from Absolutely. hitting him and killing him. I mean, he had heard my cry by day. He had given me knowledge by vision. He's testifying of Jesus Christ. It's, it's like he's building and building and building and saying, I know my life is hard. And Tracy, I've done this. I remember after my parents had passed away and I was asked to go to to Boston. It's a long story. My mom had passed away. I went to Boston. Dustin had proposed and broke up the engagement. I mean, it was like I was at the bottom. My mom, it, I mean, my dad had just found out that he was, he was um, diagnosed with liver cancer and they gave him a month to live. The house that I was renting had flooded while I was home to visit my father because I knew I wouldn't be able to, see, I thought I wouldn't be able to see him again. I came back to this house, flooded, no husband, no, no, no fiance anymore, no, no mother. And I just felt so like, Rrr. and then I had this moment where I just went backwards and I started, it, do you really believe in Joseph Smith? Do you really believe in the book of Mormon Barb? Do you really believe? And finally it came to, do you really believe in Jesus Christ? Yeah. Because if you do, you're going to be fine yeah. and you need to get out of bed and you need to Go to that institute building and you need to teach the gospel because you've been blessed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yes, you are hurting. And yes, your, your fiance that you're planning on marrying at an old age in your life, for me, did just break up with you. And yes, your mom is, is gone. And you know what? You have the Savior. Yeah. Sometimes I think that when we, we walk through this life and we have a smile on our face, People may think that it's because there's nothing wrong. We've never had a we've never had a struggle. We've never we've never lost someone we love. We've never had a breakup. We've never. That is not the case. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I I love about these scriptures is there's an acknowledgement that hard things, very very hard things, have happened here. Yeah. But they live after the manner of happiness because they know in whom they've trusted. And that's what Nephi says there. O oh Lord, verse 34, I have trusted in thee and I will trust in thee forever. Absolutely. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh, for I know that cursed is he that putteth his trust in the arm of flesh. Cursed is he that putteth his trust in man or maketh flesh his arm. Yea, I know that God will give liberally to him that asketh. And then he goes forward. I know. It's beautiful. And and I, I remember when I would, was reading these passages in my mind, because primary, yeah. and I love primary. <laughs> what, you don't get this deep in primary? Or I you? know. <laughs> but sometimes primary can help us frame what we're, what we're reading here. Yeah. And I honestly, I was hearing that song from primary, and I'm still learning all the primary songs. How are you doing? Anyway. Getting, getting there, I love them. They absolutely teach doctrine. They fill me with the spirit. I'm, I'm expanding. And as I mentioned, sometimes there's a framework that helps me put into context the things that I'm studying. Okay, but I Just have to like ask, yeah. do you have a favorite? Oh, that's like the hardest. Come one. on, every, Tracy. Every week I have a favorite. <laughs> this okay, week, okay. it's the song that I heard when I was reading this. Um, it's a child's prayer. Oh, I do love that I song. Just, I was listening to... You know, these words, Heavenly Father, are you really there? And do you hear and answer every child's prayer? It felt as intimate as that as I was reading yeah. these verses from Nephi. And then you hear, speak, I'm here, I'm listening. And being called to remember that absolutely, even I think we've all had those moments where we're on our knees looking for Heavenly Father to help us, help us acknowledge that there's these really hard things that I'm happening, hence the reasoning why I'm at things feel yeah. out of control. <laughs> yeah. Heavenly Father, are you really there? Yeah. Yep. And then when you start to speak to him and you're in conversation, what he often does is to remind you, absolutely yes. I'm here. Yep. And do you remember when? Do you remember this? It's such a gift. And I feel like um, Nephi is really patterning that for us. Yes. Here is the gift of that. Speak to Heavenly Father. Talk. Get on your knees. Pray. Understand what it is. Let, let the Spirit fill you with memory yep. to remind you just how near God is so that you can understand where the source of your happiness ought to lie. And that He really is going to be the one that comes and encircles and, and, and enfolds you regardless of the circumstances that are happening in our lives. Yes. I, I love that you're talking about this prayer with children. I mean, as, as, as a mother of these two little girls, 
I mean, I want them so, I want them so bad to know that God is listening. I yes. mean, I just, like when we say a prayer as family and sometimes they, you know, they kneel down and then, you know, I, they look, I look over and their eyes are open or they're laying on the floor. And they're just like, Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Like, yeah. okay, do you remember? You're, you're actually talking to someone, girls. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but at the yeah. same time, I'm so, but there's this balance of not wanting to be too heavy handed, but also wanting them to recognize that God really does listen to their prayers and he, and they really do need to pray. I'm grateful that they've had experiences in their lives where they have seen and, and know that God has answered their prayers yeah. But boy, as a mom, I, I want so desperately for my little girls to know that they can trust in God because you know what? I'm not going to be there someday. And I want them to know what I know, that even yeah. when they lose those they love or when something else happens, God will not forget them. Yes. He is there. So Tracy, I, I have a, maybe a transition here a little bit. You may know a little bit about my story. My, Dustin and I got married a little bit older, and we tried to have children for years and, and could not. And we received the blessing of having these two, two most beautiful, fun, exciting, crazy, gorgeous, gorgeous, lovely, darling. I mean, they are, they are maybe too gorgeous. I'm a little bit concerned for Dustin when they start dating, <laughs> to be honest. Not, I'm not concerned about them. I'm concerned for their father. Yeah. But that being said, yeah. we look at some of these scriptures in here and I, so they are, their, their background is is Polynesian Brazilian. Yeah. And so their skin is a beautiful, they just have the most beautiful brown skin. Yeah. Um, and I know from past experience with them that that they they are question askers. Yeah. They which I love that they ask questions and I encourage the questions. But we ha- but we as a little family haven't gotten to this point in the Book of Mormon yet where we talk about where it talks about in chapter 5. Um, I'll I'll read this to you because I I I genuinely want your help. Yeah. So it says in here, they're talking about this cursing. And in verse 21, it says, And had caused the cursing, this is because of wickedness, had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him. I hope my girls never do, but that, you know. And they had become like unto, unto a flint, wherefore as they were white and, del- and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. And thus saith the Lord God, I will cause that they shall be loathsome unto unto thy people, save they shall repent of their iniquities, and curses shall be the seed of him that mixeth with their seed. And it goes on a little bit here. Tracy, I I know that, that this is a conversation that I need to have with my children, but I want help from you in knowing how to discuss this this topic here, and maybe future topics, but but what what do I do when I get to Second Nephi chapter five with my yeah. darling little, perfect, cute, great, yeah, faithful daughters? Lovely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I want to be strong in the church and grounded in the gospel, and yeah. you know. I think it's an important question, and I absolutely understand the sensitivities because we're seeing words that I think um, reflect some concerns that are in our present and modern day world that we might be laying on top of these particular verses because there's a reality of uh, prejudice. There's a reality of racism. There's a reality of bigotry. There are all these challenges that exist in our modern day experience for a lot of us that um, we struggle with. And then that creates a sensitivity when we feel like we're reflecting them or finding them in places that might we might expect sanctuary. Well, and frankly, Mama Bear Barb comes out, and you're like, "You want what are you saying about my right. beautiful girls?" Right. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. There's there all of that is completely understandable because there's just the reality of the world that we're living in. Yeah. What I want to make sure that we're able to do is we're looking at the right sources to help answer the questions about those topics. And that we're not isolating a few verses in 2 Nephi chapter 5, thinking that the objective or the purpose of those verses is to instruct us about the things that we're talking about in the modern and present day world. Got it. And my feeling is I've studied this and as I've talked to my own children and I've done my own pondering and my own praying, is that that's not what the Lord's trying to teach us here, especially holistically. I kind of mentioned at the beginning yeah. when you asked me to, to consider these particular chapters. What did I learn? Chapter three and chapter four, I saw so much of God's mercy. I see so much of these blessings of of this message that says, 
I am going to try to give you everything. And even when you make mistakes, I'm going to make sure that your children are blessed. I'm going to do everything that I can do to give you salvation and offer you what you need to get on the covenant path and return to our Father in heaven. I'm going to do that for you. God's mercy is so rampant in all of these verses. Yeah. And there are times that his warnings start to be present. There are messages alongside his mercy are these warnings that start to emerge, these reminders towards obedience, these reminders that faithfulness helps resolve consequences that may be negative. Kind of like what we teach our own children. Absolutely. I mean, this, is our, this is our normal this conversation. This is the way that we right? do it, yeah, right? Okay. There's mercy. Yeah. There's also warnings and warnings that might say something specific will happen if, if you choose to be disobedient in this case. Yeah. And I think there are things that we, we want to remember. In chapters three and four, the warnings emerge to yeah. Laman and Lemuel and their seed about the curse specifically. Yeah. And then what we're seeing is a manifestation of that mm. in chapter five. But I want, you know what's really interesting, Barbara? Yeah, tell you me. You started with verse 21 yeah. in chapter five. Yep. You didn't start with verse 20. And I think that verse 20 is super significant. Okay, let's go there. Let's go to verse 20. Yep. It says, wherefore... The word of the Lord was fulfilled, which he spake unto me, which mm, saying, that's good, Tracy, yep. I warned you. Yep. And now we're seeing the fulfilling, the fulfillment of the warning because you didn't heed. Yeah. You didn't heed the warning saying that inasmuch as they will not hearken unto thy words, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And behold, they were cut off from his presence. Sometimes I think we focus on what is the method and the manifestation of God's divine justice. Yeah. You know, curses are found throughout all scriptural history. You see them in the Old Testament from the very beginning. <laughs> That's the, true. The, the serpent was, was cursed for being beguiled. Yep. You see the land being cursed for the sake of Adam and Eve. You see the, the nation of Israel being cursed because they didn't pay tithes and offering. We even see Jesus pronouncing curses on certain cities. And then we're here in the new world. We have to understand that curses is a manifestation, a, one of the manifestations of God's divine mm. justice. It's a principle of the gospel. It's a principle of the okay. gospel, mercy and justice. Yeah. And, but he also warns us. He warns us to help us remember that there are ways he, to remove curses and to avoid curses, yeah. okay. right? Yeah. There, there's that part of it. Okay. And... I think, I think in the, in the grand scheme of what we're reading here, it first tells us that maybe the worst thing, the primary thing, there are two things. The primary thing that occurred was that they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. Yeah. Hands down the worst. Hands down the Hands worst. Hands down. Right? Yep. yep. And then we have this question of their skin. And I understand the sensitivity that we described we kind of lay what's happening in the modern world on top of these few verses. And we say, we see the words white, we see the word skin, and we see the word darkness. And those things might trigger within us a reaction that echoes things that we're experiencing in the modern world or that we're concerned about in the yeah. modern world. But I really don't think that these scriptures were meant to address that topic. We know 2 Nephi verse, chapter 26, verse 33 yeah. teaches us so much about what God expects of us and our understanding about human race and family. And we'll get there. That's the black and white, bond and, and free, get, male yes, and female. That, all that, are that will alike come, onto God. Right? All We're going to get there. But we don't want to limit what God's trying to teach us about mercy and justice and law and warnings and prophets. And, in, you know, we're, we're trying to learn a lesson here. And, and I think trying to debate the percentage of pigment, because I think that's what we end up yeah, doing. Yeah, you're right. And that's, what's, that's what we're going to focus on. We're yeah. going to focus on debating what is, the, what is the percentage of pigment between the word white and dark in these verses. Yeah. And we're going to fixate on that. Because on, my daughters are. Because they have. I mean, there's right. even one that's lighter than the right. other. And I can see already saying Guess who? You know, I mean, right. I, don't, I don't want right. it to go there. We if don't it's not want necessary. it to go there because okay. that's not what the scriptures are saying. It doesn't cre create a, 
a, a framework to say, this is how God populated the entire planet of all of the varying uh, versions of humanity that are yeah. race, you know, that there are lots of races of people. And it doesn't say in these, in these verses of scriptures, this is how God creates races of people yeah. as part of a curse. It doesn't say that. Our modern day sensibilities and concerns about what, what is happening in the world, about are not heeding to 2 Nephi 26, yeah. verse 33, is what ends up being the concern. So how do we make sure that we really understand that God manifests curses in lots of different ways, and I don't think that's the point. Like yeah. the manifestation of it is the, not the point. The fact that he warns us, the fact that being cut off from his presence is a really big deal. Yeah. And the fact that while there, there is a lot of mercy in the gospel, part of God's expression of help for us is understanding that he warns us about consequences as any good parent does. Mm, and we know good. this because of this is our pattern. So let's try not to make this about something that it's not. God doesn't seek to answer the question about human, human's race right. in these three verses. He's teaching us something that he doesn't want you to isolate those verses. He wants them in context of everything that's being taught. And then let's ask the question, where do I go to answer the question about the modern day ills? Where do I take those yeah. things that hurt, that I'm holding, that I'm worried about? Is it, is it here that I place that or does it get answered somewhere else? And we know that there are lots of helps for that which include the Book of Mormon, yeah. which include the, the New Testament, which include modern day prophets and apostles. We know what President Nelson has taught us about that topic, about Absolutely. our modern day ills. Right? Yeah, and in fact, Tracy, I think this is such an important part because I, what I love that you're doing is you're not just skirting the topic. No. My girls won't allow me to skirt Absolutely the topic. Not. I mean, you name it, they'll ask it and they will, they will dig it in. And they you want know? to know. And that doesn't mean that I always have the answers, but what I do want to do with my children is be authentic with them and say, I'm, I'm go, I'm willing to go deep with you. I'm willing to figure this out with you. And so I know it's genuine, it's a genuine question. So part of it, it sounds like is helping them, helping them understand what is and what isn't being said. But then also, I love that you said that with President Nelson, because it is our day and we do deal with this in our day. And whether it's or not reality. That was, it is. You mentioned this. I'll, I'll read this, but I love this, this quote. He says, the, the creator of us all calls on each of us to abandon attitudes of prejudice against any group of God's children. Any of us who has prejudice towards any other race needs to repent. And then he continues. I, I think this is so powerful and something I need to be teaching my children on many levels. During the Savior's earthly ministry, he constantly ministered to those who were excluded, marginalized, judged, overlooked, abused, and discounted. So now we are getting to the principle here, the importance yeah. of human beings, the importance of God's children. Absolutely. Then he says, as his followers, can we do anything less? The answer is no. We believe in freedom, kindness, and fairness for all of God's children. We need to foster our faith. We need to foster fundamental respect for human dignity of every soul. Regardless, regardless of their color, their creed, or their cause. And then he finishes with this, Tracy, I just love it. We need to work tirelessly to build bridges of understanding rather than creating walls of segregation, which we could do here if we're not careful, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And then finally, I plead with us to work together for peace, for mutual respect, and for an outpouring of love for all of God's children. Amen. If, if I could teach my children, my daughters, to have an outpouring of love for all of God's children, I think that I have succeeded on many levels. I if I can so. just do that, right, Tracy? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's possible. Remember that God loves all his children and that the scriptures are meant to help testify of our relationship and connection to Jesus Christ, who is the source of our salvation. He is the source of our happiness. He is he who invites all of us to come on to him. That's not an exclusionary gospel. This yeah. is an absolutely inclusive gospel, wide open arms and circled round about all his children on his planet because God is that big. Yeah. God is that big. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna share one last quote with you. This is, this is by Elder Wong. He says, God is our heavenly father. He loves, us, he loves all of us. He knows our potential way better than we know ourselves. He knows not only the details of our lives, 
God knows the details of the details of the details of our lives. I, I, I love that. I love that, that he knows us on that level and that he has prophets, seers, and revelators on the earth today who are called at this time. This is the time for President Nelson. This is the time that we need this prophet to be guiding us in these latter days. We've had a great experience. And Tracy, I cannot thank you enough for, for being here today and for the example you are for me and for my daughters. But what is the therefore what for you? Well, first, Barbara, thank you for having me. This has been a really wonderful, enriching conversation, and I love to study the scriptures. And the therefore what to me is every time I open the Book of Mormon, I hear the voice of the Lord. And that means that I have an opportunity to listen and to be guided. President Nelson invited us to hear him. Him is Jesus Christ. The Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. And when I seek to be in the scriptures and to study and to ponder and to pray and invite the Holy Ghost to fan my desires, to instruct my understanding, I receive guidance and direction. And that's been true since I was 16 years old, mm. since I made the commitment to read the Book of Mormon from the beginning to the end. And we know that this year, as a global church, we have that invitation to study the Book of Mormon together. And what a powerful just understanding that we're all doing this. We're all in the scriptures and we all have the ability to hear the Lord speak to us individually. Thank you, Tracy. The Lord does speak through this book for sure, for sure. We are grateful again for Tracy Browning being with us here today, and we are grateful for you being with us here today. We, we would just love to encourage you to continue to join with us as we gather together to be grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ and to become more like him. We'll see you next week. Thank you.